Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon and welcome to the Oxford Martin School. Welcome to the second of our um, lecture series this term. Um, we're delighted to have Professor Ben Ansell here um, to talk to us. Ben is the Professor of Comparative Democratic Institutions in the Department of Politics and International Relations and a Professorial Fellow at Nuffield. He researches a wide area of comparative politics and political economy currently working on the interplay between inequality and democratization and the effects of housing price booms and busts on political preferences. Uh, he's won the William H. Riker Award for Best Book in Political Economy twice, um, including, um, and then for the second book on inequality and democratization, also won the Woodrow Wilson Prize. Um, he was elected a fellow of the British Academy last year and is a co-editor of Comparative Political Studies. So today, Ben is going to be talking to us about wealth inequality in political perspective. Um, the last decade has seen a huge surge in interest in um, economic inequality, but much scholarship has ignored wealth as opposed to, and has focused on income. So Ben today is going to examine the potential impact of wealth inequality on contemporary politics from standard debates around things like taxation to the rise of populism. So he would struggle to make this more topical. So, um, Ben. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, for that um, very kind introduction. It's really exciting to be part of a series on evolving economic thought when you're not an economist. Um, I am a political economist, which is, is whatever you want it to be, which is a wonderful discipline. Um, my interest, uh, like many of the talks in this series, is on contemporary changes to the structure of the global economy, whether that is in terms of industrial structure, education, uh, or, uh, and this is what my current interest is in, in the massive, sur massive surge and collapse in wealth, in particular in residential wealth, i.e. housing, over the last 20 years. Um, whereas many of the other speakers will be sort of focusing on how those trend, trends are playing out and, and what their future trajectories might be. My interest is on what this means for politics. Um, my initial interest was on what this meant for redistributive politics, that is the politics of taxes and spending, and that's an area of great interest uh, in political science. Um, but of course we've had a number of recent elections, uh, and those elections seem to be playing out on a slightly different dimension, what political scientists often call the, the second dimension, a dimension of politics that is less about redistribution between rich and poor and more about group-based identity, about attitudes towards cosmopolitanism, um, authority, and so on. And the question I have and, and the answers I'm going to try and give you today um, relate to how the housing market in particular, but wealth more generally, might affect both forms of politics. How useful is the housing market if we want to think about how politics has been playing out in terms of how people think about the world and in terms of the geographical divides in what people vote for. Now, all of this is being supported at the moment by a grant from the European Union, uh, from the European research community. So I guess when we get to the Brexit part, you can just shut off your ears if you, if you think that biases it. Um, but it is, um, it's a project called WealthPol, the politics of wealth. And so a lot of the work I'm going to be talking about today relies very heavily on work done by the postdocs and graduate students who are part of that team. So I wanted to thank them for their efforts on this before I begin and take credit for it here. Um, so, why wealth inequality for a political scientist? Well, the thing is, political scientists know a lot about how income differences matter. We know a lot about how class matters. Uh, every time you look at a public opinion survey by YouGov, you'll see the old A, B, C1, C2, D, E forms of occupational coding for class and their relationship to voting for parties that promise to transfer resources from richer to poorer citizens. We, we know a lot about that. We have very clear expectations about that. We know a lot about how changes in the real economy of you know, production and, and the labor market affect your likelihood of being re-elected as an incumbent, what we call retrospective voting. But we don't know very much about how any of this plays out when we turn to wealth, when we turn to what people own as opposed to what job they do. And that should matter. It should matter not least because the housing market is increasingly salient in most people's lives, and oftentimes politically. Look at the way that Margaret Thatcher and George W. Bush both talked about ownership societies. 
But we don't have a lot of theoretical traction on that as political scientists, and we don't have a lot of, of uh, empirical evidence. And part of the reason for that is it's really hard to measure this stuff in surveys. So what we're going to talk about mostly today is residential wealth, and the reason for that, and by that I mean housing, the reason for that is that's the kind of information that we do have a lot of in surveys. We know whether people own houses, that's commonly asked. We know about what local house prices look like. As we'll see in some surveys, we even ask people how much we think the house is worth. But many of the things I talk about today should spread over to other forms of wealth, financial wealth in terms of the kinds of assets you have in capital markets, stocks and bonds and so on, or savings accounts, or your pension. But here I'm going to punt a little and say that's what my ERC project is supposed to develop data on, because it's much harder to get that data and it's rarely asked in surveys. But one thing I want to highlight here is that residential wealth in particular is locally specific, it's locally situated. The value of your house depends on its location, 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 as you all know from watching 28 seasons of Kirsty and Phil. Right? Where you live matters for how much your house is worth, but where you live also depends on who you get to vote for and what local voting patterns look like. And as housing markets become more volatile, and as housing prices diverge across the country, the question is, how that's going to play out politically, and that's what I want to bring to your attention today. At this point, I should start the clock on my screen, otherwise I'll never know how much time I have. So, how does wealth vary, and why might it be different from income? I, I want to begin with some really aggregate pictures and graphs and tables that give you a sense of how wealth differs from income and, and where Britain fits, because I will be talking a lot about um, British politics today. Um, OK, the first thing to know about wealth is it's really, really unequally distributed as compared to income. And that shouldn't surprise you, because if richer people save more and more of their income into their wealth, then we're going to see divergence almost mechanically. But if you look at this table over here, which is data that comes from Ken Shorix's work, it has the well-known Gini indicator, in this case a 0 to 100 uh, indicator of the uh, inequality of the distribution of wealth. Genies of income normally vary between, say, 35 and 50 in most countries. And the genie of wealth here is varying, you know, starting at low 60s up to almost 90. Right? So much more varied. But you can also see here the shares of the wealth distribution as Shorix calculates them. How much of overall wealth do the top 10% of the wealth distribution have? You can see that at its lowest, it's around 50%. At its highest, it's almost three quarters, or around three quarters. The top 1% have an enormous amount of wealth in most countries, right? Around, you know, looking at this, around 30% on average here. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing to just get in the back of your mind is wealth is really, really unequally distributed. And there's a line in political science that democracy was a deal between the rich and the poor, where the rich agreed to have their income taxed so that no one touched their wealth. Well, you can sort of see that play out here. Uh, that's Jeff Winters' argument, not mine. Um, the second thing to note is that the standard patterns that we're used to with income inequality at the national level don't hold up that well in wealth. Now, it depends on how you measure wealth, and wealth is very tricky to measure, so don't take this as the last word. Uh, but the colour scheme here is a colour scheme that students of political science will be familiar with. It's the Varieties of Capitalism scheme, which splits into the Anglo-American liberal world of high wage inequality and the so-called coordinated market economies, coordinated because they have unions compressing wages, as in the Nordic countries and the continental countries. Now, those Nordic countries and continental countries, our friends Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Germany, are normally towards the bottom of the income inequality table. And they're right up at the top here, sandwiching the United States. This is uh, not making America great again here. It's, not, it's being beaten by Denmark on wealth inequality. Um, and down at the bottom, we have a number of countries, Spain, Greece, uh, Italy, that actually have really quite high income inequality, but quite low wealth inequality. And, and part of that is the way that property is transferred from generation to generation in those countries. So the first thing to keep in the back of your mind is wealth is probably different. We don't know a lot about it yet, and I'm not going to answer all those questions today. The second thing is that there's a lot of temporal variation. Now, this is um, slightly mechanical, the temporal variation here. This is from the Bank of International Settlements. And it is um, across 20-odd countries with um, national nominal house prices indexed at 100 in 1990. And so the question is, OK, from that index, what happens to the distribution of house prices across those countries over time? So if you look at the circle in the middle, that's the average country. And you can see that the nominal house prices in the average country increased dramatically in the 90, late 90s, early 2000s. Then we had the crash, but notice there wasn't much of a crash, at least in the aggregate. And then we had QE, 
or we had some other house price boom over recent years, right? So that's our roller coaster ride of housing. But I think the more salient aspect here, because we know that story already, is how much divergence there's been across countries. Right? So if all countries had followed exactly the same trend, then our little distribution here would just be our dot, like in 1990 or the way up. But what's happened is there's been more variation over countries over time. And so more dispersion. That's cross-nationally, and I'll show it that that's exactly the same regionally within the UK in just a second. But before I do, I want to talk a little bit more about how housing varies within Europe. And that's with this figure here. Just so you get a sense of where the UK fits in. Okay, this is from Eurostat, this data from 2015. We have the home ownership rate along the x-axis, and we have, of those homeowners, how many have mortgages along the y-axis. And there's a few things that might be striking for you that I didn't know about until I started this, this kind of work. The first is how low home ownership rates in the Germanic world are. Right, so Che is not Che Guevara, it's Switzerland, and, and they're rarely confused. Um, so that's at the top left here with very, very low levels of home ownership. Uh, DEU being Germany, AUT being Austria, okay, also low levels. On the far right here, we have a number of post-Soviet countries with extremely high home ownership levels, not least because at the fall of communism, many people received property directly as a transfer during the transition period. We also see a lot of variation in terms of how reliant people are on mortgages. So if you received your house from the collapsing um, Soviet bloc government uh, that previously um, I guess ran your house for you, then you didn't take out a mortgage. Right? And that's true down the bottom here. In Romania, home ownership is high, mortgage rates are extremely low. Also, underdeveloped capital markets, there's a whole variety of reasons why that might be true. What you might not be expecting is that the group of homeowners most reliant on mortgages are in the Nordic world. Now, what exactly the relationship there is there between that and the high levels of wealth inequality we saw a few slides ago, I'm not quite sure. Um, but it, again, it's a surprise if you think about political economy the way that people who focus on the labor market tend to, which is viewing these Scandinavian countries as highly decommodified countries with lots of state intervention. Well, that's not true in the housing market. Now, where's the UK? Boringly, averagely, right in the middle of this graph. And I find this fascinating because we're so used to, in this country, talking about housing as a specifically British disease. Oh, our housing markets are terrible. Our, our youth are unable to afford houses. Our mortgage markets are massively overvalued. All people care about is homeownership. The homeowners block any kind of development. Well, I hate to tell you, but that's true in most countries. Right? And you start looking at what, how people are locked out of the housing market in Copenhagen or Stockholm, you find similar stories. So Britain is right in the middle here. Everything I'm going to tell you about Britain today could theoretically apply elsewhere, and I will show you a number of examples where it does. Okay, so I said I, I promised that I would talk about, whoop, but I've gone too fast, um, housing markets in the UK. Yeah, you see, if you press it twice, it does move twice. Here we are. Okay, so this is another of these so-called violin plots, a distributional plot that gives you a sense for each year what the distribution of house prices within the United Kingdom looks like. So, this is going to sound slightly complex, but let me see if I can get it out. This data comes from the land registry, which is publicly available data, which records every house transaction in the UK, and um, right down to the postcode. But w what we're doing here is aggregating it at the ward level. Now, we'll talk more about wards later on, but they have uh, around 5,000 people in, right? So, Summertown is a ward. Jericho is a ward. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. Um, the graph, each distribution, so for 1996, say, takes the median house sales price in each ward of houses actually sold, across the whole country, and it looks at the distribution in that. So you can see that distribution is centered on a house price of around £80,000 at the time. And that typical ward, over time, had a median house price that rose to about £200,000 just before the crash, and then started rising again recently. We know that story. We probably also intuit the other story, which I find much more dramatic here, which is just how much this has spread out. Now, in part, that's because these are nominal house prices, so there has been inflation, so you'd expect a little bit of spreading out because of that. But really, it's driven mostly by massive amounts of divergence within the British housing market, such that our graph has to include a million pound up here as the median house price sale in a ward in Britain. And there are plenty of wards in central London where that's true. Indeed, I fear it may increasingly become true in Summertown. Right, so we have an enormous amount of variation in wealth 
in the UK. And the question is, how is that going to play out politically? OK, well, before we get there, I just want to start with thinking about what the kind of boring, normal politics of housing look like. OK, that is the kind of politics that political scientists like to talk about. Can the poor tax the rich? Do poor people want higher taxes? Do rich people want lower taxes? How do the rich stop the poor from taxing them, et cetera, et cetera? And a lot of my previous work, including the book mentioned on inequality and democratization, is about precisely that story. Not least because it's really easy to think about. We expect richer people, on the whole, to want lower taxes than poorer people. The question is, does that transfer over to housing? Because when we talk about rich, normally we're talking about incomes. Or at least when we come to the data, that's what we end up having to talk about, because that's what the data is in surveys. And so the question is, does that, even netting out the income effect, transfer over to housing? And it won't shock you to discover that, yes, it does. But what that means, then, is if we think about places with high house prices versus low house prices, we should expect that the former to vote conservative and the latter to vote for left-wing parties, the Labour Party in this country, and so on. Okay? So that's what the politics should look like on the first dimension. And for the most part, it does look like that. What's, what's newer, both in terms of the real world and in terms of my study of this, is how to think about second dimension politics, politics that cuts across traditional left-right economic lines. Why are both political parties in this country split on Brexit? They're split because half of their MPs live in districts that voted Remain. Actually, that's not quite right, right? It's about 38% of them do because of the way that's structured. And the remainder, the larger remainder, live in Leave districts. But that's true for both parties to varying degrees. Right? That must mean that the geography of the Brexit vote doesn't quite match up with the geography of traditional left-right voting in this country. And so we'll see this turns out to be true not only in the UK, but in the US and in France and in four Nordic countries, and we'll get to that. But let's begin with the easy stuff, wealth inequality and redistributive politics. Okay, so this is easy stuff. This is what we talk about in political behavior all the time, left-right voting along economic lines, high-income people want lower taxes and lower spending because they don't want to pay the taxes for it, at least if they can recognize that taxes and spending have to add up in the long run. And does it work the same for wealth? We would expect it to, but here's a slightly more nuanced question. Once we net out people's, not only their transitory income, but their income over the lifespan, but we vary their wealth, maybe because there's an exogenous shock to house prices or something, or they get a bequest, does this also play out? Okay. Now, it would be lovely if we had, uh, lovely but big brother, if we had information on people's financial assets uh, you know, perfectly represented in surveys. Now, the Scandinavians do have things like that in their registry data, but, but we don't, and maybe there are good reasons we don't. But what we do ask people about, and actually what we have a lot of public information about, is house prices. And so that is essentially what I'm going to do for the remainder of today's talk. I don't feel like I should have to apologize for talking about house prices because everybody's obsessed with them, and so it'll be fun and entertaining. But we should keep in mind that this ought to work for other forms of financial assets to a greater or lesser extent. OK, now, this is the sort of most wordy slide I have for you, but I just want to lay out a variety of ways in which housing could matter for people's redistributive preferences. And we can see it mattering on both sides of the ledger. Right? On the one hand, you might want lower taxes directly because when your property goes up in value, or your wealth goes up in value, you get taxed on it. In Denmark, that's a land tax. In the US, that's your property assessment every year, which I remember being deeply dispiriting when I lived in America, and I kept getting them from 2008 to 2009 to 2010, as Minneapolis told me how much less my house was worth each year. And the benefit of which was I had to pay less taxes, but didn't feel like that. Um, Property taxes we have in the UK, and council taxes. We have them in these weird bands that aren't really very proportional to the price of the house, but nonetheless, you still have to pay more if your house is worth more. Your children or heirs have to pay more at the inheritance point as if you're above the threshold when you die. And if you sell your house, and it's a second house, you almost certainly will have to pay capital gains, and in many countries, on your first property as well. So for all kinds of reasons, we might expect some types of tax aversion. But notice that's not normally the tax that people talk about when they talk about tax. People mean income tax. So there's a question about whether owning a house and your house going up in value makes you not only dislike taxes on property, on that actual wealth, but on income more generally. Do you adopt the preferences of the rich? And I don't have any good evidence for this. I'm not going to be able to show this to you today. But I think it's a conjecture we should take seriously that changes, because of the way that people engage in mental accounting, changes in one part of their world might make them behave in ways that their incomes would not predict. Okay. Spending, 
it's sometimes easier to make a case for here why people who own houses might want lower spending. And I think the big important one is actually at the bottom, but I'll do the others first. Sometimes you might want less spending on a social good because owning a house means you can't access that good. Okay? The prime example in the UK here is long-term care, which you have to pay for, or a proportion of, until your house is worth something like £25,000. Now, lest you think this is not politically salient, I give you the general election of 2017, where it became very, very politically salient, and a dementia tax and so on, right? So, you could imagine um, that if people felt that by owning a house, they weren't going to receive various forms of government spending, public housing is another obvious example, they might want less spending. That's going to be limited to a few domains. The top part of the ledger could, of course, convert to the bottom part, which is you want less spending because you know that you want lower taxes and you have to have lower spending for it. But I think the third one here is, is the one that, that is a more characteristic form of thinking about this, which is that people think they can rely on their house instead of social insurance. That is, people oftentimes try and swap their owning a house for a public pension, or they haven't saved enough for the pension, but they have saved for the house so they think they'll be fine. Or they're not so worried about changes to their public pension because, again, they think, well, I can fall back on my house. I could reverse mortgage my house if I had to. Worst comes to worst, I could sell it. Okay. Now, this is going to be most effective, I think, for pensions, but it could also work for unemployment insurance at a push. Right? You don't want to have to sell your house if you lose your job, but better to be able to do that and keep yourself afloat than not have the house at all. So, both on the tax and spending side, I think you ought to expect higher house prices to filter into a lower desire for redistribution, more right-wing economic policy preferences. Now, how would you measure that? I'm going to talk very briefly about data here, because there's two types of data I'm going to use in today's talk. One is geographical, and that is taking the very good data we have on regional house prices, extremely good in the UK, pretty good in the US, practically non-existent in Germany, depends on where you are. But what that house price data does is it allows you to make an apples-to-apples -apples comparison of people who live in different localities. The problem is, of course, I know someone owns a house from a survey, and I know where they live, and I know what house prices are in that district, but people don't own the average house in their district, or rather there's a distribution of houses within a particular district. So a better question would be, how much is your house worth? But of course, here we have to rely on how much people think the house is worth, which means now we're bringing in all kinds of optimism bias or pessimism bias if you're me in 2009, or just a, a complete lack of knowledge, or relying on how much you bought the house for and not taking inflation into account, right? all kinds of other potential problems. Okay. So in a lot of this data analysis, when you have both, you can cross-reference, and it turns out that um, the correlation between these two variables is about 0.6, so it's not terrible, but it's not amazing. It's, it's, it's better than awful, but um, each of these will, will give you sort of different amounts of information. Now, the first graph I'm going to show you comes from the British Household Panel Survey. N the British Household Panel Survey ran between 1991 and 2006, before it became the UK HLS, and took out all the interesting questions for political scientists. So thank you to the sociologists for that. Um, but it did have a question about individual house prices. Um, and the questions it has on social policy aren't perfect, but it has a question about, do you support a full employment policy, a form of social insurance policy, at least in the labor market? Uh, it has a number of other similar questions about the rich and poor uh, that you can aggregate. So I'm just showing you one question here. This comes from an analysis I did, netting out people's permanent income over the sample, their gender, uh, where they live, uh, their occupational status, and so on and so forth, just trying to take their estimate of how much their house price is worth and comparing across people. And in fact, we're looking at changes in house price on change in employment values and then putting it back in data here. So, generally, generally speaking, what we see is that people who think they own a more expensive house, at least, or answer that way, are much less likely to support a full employment policy. This kind of result comes up again and again when you have social insurance questions. So it turns out to work for social security policy in America, their retirement scheme. And this graph here comes from the International Social Survey Program, uh, which is across 19 countries in 2009. And it asks a question that, well, that's not as good as how much do you think your house is worth, but it says, if you had to sell your house tomorrow, what would you have left? And so, uh, where I've written neg equity for negative equity on the left down there, that, that's in the survey, it's actually just debts, which is really sad. <laughs> just debts. Okay, but presumably your house is, is, you sell your house and you would still have lots of debts. Now, it could be, of course, you have other debts. We can't rule that out. Uh, and then we have renters, 
And then we have the people who answered, I would have this much left over, i.e. people who, who claim that they would have a small amount of equity measured in the national currency up to a high amount. So it's cross-national survey. It's not super clear exactly what high equity means in each of these cases. All that aside, um, both of these lines, and I'll explain what they are in a second, although you can see yourself, are negatively sloping. That is, as people move from negative equity to high equity, they're more willing to, and our dependent variable here is, strongly support taxing the rich to give more to the poor. Okay, so a classic redistribution question that political economists like. It turns out the kinds of findings we find for income also play out uh, in terms of housing. Now, the reason I've got two lines here is that this is much stronger for right-wingers. Um, it's stronger not only because the line is steeper, but the error bands, that is our uh, prediction confidence intervals here, which take into account both uncertainty about the inference and uncertainty about predicting this thing, um, they're narrower. Right? So they're, at the top, our left-wing voters is borderline statistically significant. It's the other way to think about this. Um, but for right-wing voters, it's extremely statistically significant. And that turns out to be the case in UK data. So if I redid this graph just for right-wingers, uh, and in US data as well. So there's something about people who are conservative, at least identify that way politically, that makes them more responsive to changes in their material circumstances to vote this way. I mean, it, it's interesting, there's lots of conjectures about why this is the case, because it turns out to be true for uh, unemployment as well as house prices. Um, but what it does suggest is that Margaret Thatcher was no dummy. Right? This was a good way of activating the conservative base. And indeed, there is a logic to high house prices for, cons and George W. Bush, the same, a logic to high house prices and home ownership for conservative parties. Okay, now what I want to show you is some new data. That came from my 2014 APSR article. Um, but what I'm going to do here is talk about some work that I'm doing now with Asli Kansanar from my team. It's a postdoc in my team. So the British Election Survey in 2015 had this very cool question. And the question said to people, here is a map, a Google map, at some random scale. Type in your postcode. They type in their postcode. Right? And then at this random scale, it centers it on where they live. It says, now, choose to zoom in or out as much as you want and draw a polygon around where you consider to be your local community. Right? So some people are like, well, it's me and my neighbor. And other people are like, London. Uh, so we get some variation there, and that variation I'm not going to be able to exploit here. Um, but then it has a series of questions after that asking about your local community. How are things changed in your local community? So we know there's probably a lot of measurement and error in how big the communities people drew, drew are, but we also know that they are centered on where they live, and we do have data about where they live, not least their house price. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is match people to the local authority in which they live, Look at local house prices in that area. Look at whether they're a homeowner or not. And then how they answer questions about their local community. And I'm going to do that in two ways. Firstly, how much inequality do you think there is in your local community? Okay. Is inequality high or low? I think this is a 0 to 10 scale. I should have checked, sorry, before I came in. Okay. Uh, so this is fairly meaningful variation here. Uh, along the bottom, we have the median house price in 2015. The reason I use that is, well, it aids the survey, but also we're going to use that for the Brexit vote stuff in just a second. Um, and um, we have our perceptions of how much inequality there is, which is rising, of course, as the y-axis goes up over here. And so what do we see? Well, we see in general that people who live in more expensive places think inequality in their local area is higher. It's sort of a useful finding to know. There's no reason why that has to be true. It may be that people see wealth and they think inequality, even though everybody's equally wealthy. But it's also true that that's stronger effect among non-homeowners. So the interaction effect here is statistically significant. Not hugely so, but, but it is. That is, non-homeowners appear to react more. And that may be because they feel locked out of the more expensive housing markets. What I find kind of neat is you get the reverse picture when you look at how has your economy been doing over the last few years. That's what this one is. Uh, perceptions of how well your local economy has been growing um, and here we see, again, people in areas that are more expensive. I've truncated the x-axis, by the way, just so you can see. Um, people in more expensive areas tend to think their economy has been going better. But who thinks that more? The homeowners. And maybe that shouldn't surprise us. So we can see at least some of these effects we might expect to see about you know, how people feel they're faring, how much of a beneficiary of wealth inequality that they are. I don't know whether this, because I haven't tested it, would spill over into support for the incumbent, although it might well. Right? Homeowners in these areas on the right should be happier. But what I'm going to do now for the rest of the talk, um, for whatever time I have left, which is 
allow me to stare at this, about 10, what, 10 minutes or so, good, is talk about how wealth inequality is related to the second dimension of politics. Because now I've been talking about local communities. And of course, you might think, well, he's talking about local areas. And people, when they think about the local area, don't just think about how am I doing, but they think about how is my community doing. And once we get into that, then it feels like it's activating other parts of people's decision making. And so what my various authors and I have been doing in our work on housing and populism is talking about both individual effects, right, homeowners doing well out of the system, and what we call geotropic effects. How is my local community doing? Because after all, when the house prices are booming, other parts of the economy tend to be doing well as well. Right? So even if you're not a homeowner, and even if you feel locked out of the housing market, on the other hand, you might think, well, my area is going well. At least we're not falling behind. So Brexit. All right, a non-contentious topic. Brexit voting really cuts across the region. If you compare the maps on Wikipedia, as you're welcome to do, between the Brexit vote and the 2017 general election, you'll see there's an enormous difference between the two. Lots of true blue Oxfordshire areas voting to remain, lots of deep red areas in the West Midlands and East Midlands voting to leave, and both parties are split. And so lots of people have been thinking, well, surely there's something going on geographically here. And David Goodhart wrote a controversial book that I have a number of disagreements with, but picked up one interesting claim here, um, that you could divide Britain into somewheres and anywheres. Now, I'm all for false dichotomies, but this one ought to be somewheres versus other somewheres. Right? People who live in expensive areas that voted for Remain also live in a place. I suppose they might find it easier to move to another place, or, or they might like, you know, be like the HSBC commercial about you know, eating Korean food, watching Brazilian footballers. But they live in a place, and we can talk about that place in a meaningful way. So really, I think the way to interpret Goodhart is there are lots of geographically fixed differences in how people react to the current political status quo across the country, which I realize is less catchy than somewhere and anywhere, but there we are. So what I'm going to do now, and for most of the following graphs you'll see, I'm going to take that same land registry data about house prices, um, and I'm going to look at it at the local authority level, um, and I'm going to look at it briefly at the ward level, right, much smaller, and I'm also going to look at using Chris Hanready's very nice crosswalk at the parliamentary constituency level, where we have estimates for the Remain vote. Now, the main problem with the Brexit vote is it was collected at the local authority level, so that's where we really know what's going on. Some wards collected this data, and when the BBC did an FOIA, we got data on about 1,000 wards, but others never collected it there or threw it out, so we just don't know. What Chris was able to do with some statistical wizardry was back out what he thinks the constituency level votes were. Okay, so um, that is what we're going to look at. So let's begin with local authorities. I'm going to put Remain on the y-axis, not because it won, because it certainly didn't, uh, but because it means we have a nice upward slope on all these graphs with house prices. Okay? Uh, in other pieces of work I've done, it all flips, right? but I wanted to be consistent in, in as, as much as I could here. All right, so we have the log median house price at the local authority level, logged because that makes this distribution much easier to see and means we can have Kensington and Chelsea on the graph. Hi. Um, now, I've named a number of places you've heard of here, but th note they are all outliers. That's why I labeled them, so the labels wouldn't get confused. So Oxford was even more remainy than my prediction, and, and Boston was even more levy. Um, but what you see here is a fairly strong, very statistically significant, albeit bivariate pattern between local authority voting, uh, sorry, house prices and voting for Remain. Okay. Uh, the size of the circles is the size of the electorates, I should note. Okay. Now, this graph here, which takes away the bubbles, um, is what happens if you net out geographic effects of region and of weekly pay and unemployment and demographics. So this is netting out uh, a whole variety of uh, controls at the local authority level. And the relationship remains fairly similar. One interesting new outlier is Barking and Dagenham. Barking and Dagenham is in London, which means when you control for London, when you net out the effect of London, you realize just how levy Barking and Dagenham is relatively, but also it's definitely not a place to be an estate agent in London relative to other parts of London. Right? The house prices are cheaper there. St Albans sort of goes the other way. Right? It's more expensive than its region and other factors would predict it to be, and more remaining. Okay, this is levels. What about changes? Same deal. Okay, now that's largely because changes in levels are highly correlated in housing in Britain because them that has gets. Right, so there's divergence. We already saw that in the British housing market. Here it is again. Um, but you see places like Brighton here, which wasn't that expensive in 1996. This is the 20-year change, or 19-year change. 
but became much more expensive over this period, and it is very remaining. Hackney is another great example, right? People didn't want to live in Hackney in the mid-1990s. Those who did made a good real estate investment choice. Um, and so we see the same thing with changes. If you put both in a statistical model, both are statistically significant. Levels matter more. We would expect that, but changes matter as well. What about local inequality? Well, there might be something going on here. This is the ratio of the house at the 90th percentile of the local authority housing distribution. That's catchy, isn't it, right? An expensive house in your local authority divided by the median house price in your local authority. So this is like the skew, uh, the rightward skew of the housing distribution in its local authority. It actually looks like that's correlated to some degree of remain. So it's not the case of people being upset about local inequality and going and voting leave. If anything, the more homogenous communities I think that's the way to think about this, we're more likely to vote leave. And so this, I think, is where David Goodhart might be a bit more right, because these somewheres are more consistently a somewhere. Right? All the houses are sort of similarly priced. People look more similar in those local authorities, at least in terms of their wealth. Now, here is where it gets surprising. We saw this effect at the local authority, and you can kind of intuit that, well, if London's at the top right and you know, the northwest is, oh, sorry, the northeast is down the bottom, or, or Lincolnshire, then maybe this is a regional effect. And it's true, at the regional effect, if we just took the nine or ten regions of England and Wales, we'd see this pattern. So it works at the regional level. It works at local authority level. It also works at the ward level. This is Bristol. Okay? You know, curse you, Stoke Bishop, for screwing up this uh, beautiful pattern I have here, but it's still a fairly robust pattern of places in Bristol, wards in Bristol with cheaper houses, were much less likely to vote for Remain. Obviously, Bristol was a Remainy place, right? But we see that pattern within Bristol. Something about the housing market is fractal. Right? How well you're doing locally, relationally matters at lots of different scales. And it's sort of interesting from a political geography perspective how to think about that. But it turns out, and I don't have the graphs on me here today, but I'll tweet them, uh, this is also true in Cambridge, and it's also true in Stockport, and it's also true in Wakefield. Right? In each of these areas, the expensive wards, you know, whatever kind of netting out the local authority uh, impact is, the expensive wards were more likely to vote for Remain, the cheaper wards less likely to. Right? So when people talk about Brexit as a vote of the dispossessed, I don't think that's completely true. I mean, there's lots of people in Christchurch and other wealthy parts of the country, like everywhere I grew up in Kent, uh, that, that voted leave. But in the aggregate, you do see that type of pattern. Okay. Now, this comes from the survey data. So now I'm going down to individuals. I'm coding them in the British election survey, like I did earlier, um, by the district that they live in, the local authority, and how expensive housing is. And now I'm looking at, did you vote for Remain or not? Now, this is controlling for all kinds of other things, like income and education and, and uh, ethnicity. Um, but we're splitting out homeowners from non-homeowners. And what I want you to notice here is the homeowners are the ones who are more affected by house prices. So this result is statistically significant. Homeowners in really expensive areas are like your core remainers in the British election survey, right? They're the most strongly uh, affected. Your core leaving group are the homeowners in the cheaper areas. Okay, now, here are my, my animations I've been tweeting around. And these animations look beautiful, but they might be slightly harder to interpret than I hope. Um, but let me just tell you quickly what they are, because we're going to see a bunch of these in the next few minutes. This is the log median house price that we've seen before. And now this is average weekly pay, which at the local authority level, which we know is also correlated for, with voting uh, to remain in this case, and, and many of the statistical models I've shown you control for that already. Um, blue here is remain, yellow is leave, that's Wikipedia's coding, which I have adopted since it seems sort of vaguely neutral. Um, and what we see here is that, yeah, it's the places that are well-to-do that voted for remain. I mean, that's what we'd expect as well. But if you just watch this graph one more time, notice how it's become more dispersed over time. And so really, it's those areas kind of racing away from everywhere else that are your core remain areas. So it's no wonder that people in the leave areas do feel left behind, in a way, by these areas that are zooming ahead and have less economically in common. I don't think you know, that's hugely surprising that we would see polarization in Britain because there's been so much economic polarization across these districts. Um, this is for each region. Okay, so the effect exists in, within each of the regions. So yeah, it's true that London is mostly blue, but it's less blue down here, embarking at Dagenham and Havering. All right? And it's true that the, uh, let me find a good example here, that the East Midlands is mostly leaf, but notice the color of the ones to the far right is less yellow. Right? So it works within each region. Okay, not just a London effect, and not just an effect of comparing London with other regions. Here are the constituencies. 
Okay, this is just all the constituencies, the same thing as before. So just sort of splitting the difference. This comes from taking ward level house data and then matching it to the constituencies. What I just want to show you here is this is the 2017 general election. There's no Brexit here. Okay, this is blue for more conservative, red for Labour. I've written Labour lead here, which is <laughs> uh, the way that Corbyn talked about that election. But I will note, Labour did not lead in that election, but this is the relative Labour lead. Uh, and you can see, look, it actually comes from these poorer places in Britain. I mean, yeah, there are some red dots up here, but the Tories and Labour sort of split in the lower end of the housing market that Labour really dominates. And of course, that is the area that voted leave. This is Corbyn's problem. Right? It's a really difficult political problem. You can see over here, this is Labour's lead in 2017, or Labour's relative share, minus the share voting leave. Okay? And this is my, what might save Corbyn, is that some of these districts definitely voted leave, but they're really, really Labour. And so when push comes to shove, you might expect, well, they might back the Labour party. Right? Okay, final moving graph, and then I will cease and desist on this. Um, here we have the job seekers allowance rate, i.e. unemployment. I, I put this up, um, and sorry, L here means Labour, C means Conservative in 2017, and our colours are remain. So there's lots going on here, I recognise that. <laughs> but it's fun, it's fun, and it's beautiful. You can see it on my Twitter account if you're, if you're interested anymore. Um, you probably won't be after this. Well, notice these two areas here of Labour voters. They're the places with very, very volatile levels of unemployment, especially in the early 90s, it came down a lot. Right, during Britain's big, long economic boom, but then jumped up again here. But notice who didn't jump up. These areas in London that had actually had a lot of economic volatility in the past, but have been beneficiaries of the last 10 years of boom. So that's the split within, within the party there. All right, enough. Let's finish by talking about three other areas. Okay, what I can do for Trump and Romney, no, not Trump and Clinton, Trump and Romney. What I want to look at is populist voting between two Republican candidates, one of whom is definitely very populist, one of whom is like the least populist person I can imagine. All right, All right. makes Theresa May look like Trump. Okay, so um, what I have here is a combined congressional election survey, um, and it codes people by the zip code, and I'm taking not official government data, uh, but private sector data, this is so American, from Zillow, their Zestimate of um, single family house prices, uh, and I'm able to look at levels and changes of that. And we're gonna see it at the congressional district level. now. The important thing I want you to note here is where house prices are lower than you would anticipate, that is low relative to their state and their sort of general partisanship, you get much more relative support for Trump. Okay, now it's a little bit hard to interpret what's going on on the axis in this graph. Each of these is a congressional district. So this is the 12th district of California, the 33rd, New York, and New York over here. And you might be thinking, well, hey, Matt, why is New York spread over so much? What this graph is doing is netting out state level differences in political support or, or, part of, or Republicanism and in house prices, it's got a dummy in for each state. So this is places within a state that have much higher house prices than the average, places with much lower. Okay. And this is how well Trump did relative to Romney, again, netting out state effects. Right. So what we're trying to do is take out uh, the general differences across the US and look at these more localized differences. And this is a very strong effect. If you're in an industrial part of New York, as opposed to Long Island, both Republican districts, one at the Long Island district goes for Romney, the industrial part goes for Trump. We see the same for the French. Uh, in the French elections, I've got data, again, collected from the private sector here, that's less uh, country typical, um, from Meilleurs Agents, who collect data at the département level, so we have 90 odd département, and I'm looking at first and second round voting in the 2017 presidential election, all the time comparing to Marine Le Pen. Okay, who is the second dimension populist. Now, there were two other populists. There was Macron, who was a populist for like five minutes until that became very clear that he wasn't once he became president, right? Um, but at the time, that was not so clear. You know, uh, after all, En Marche was an entirely new creation. And then um, Mélenchon, who's definitely a populist, but of the left-right dimension very strongly. All right, so what do we see? Um, you know, it's, it's a little bit messy, but this is Macron-Le Pen first round, Macron-Le Pen second round, it's Macron minus Le Pen, and we see this positive relationship. It's true, it's definitely driven by Paris and the suburbs, but it's statistically significant without them. It's partly driven by the west of France, by the way, which has higher house prices and more support for these candidates. But it's not just Macron, Fillon, who's definitely no one's idea of a populist. Uh, him versus Le Pen, you get this similar pattern, and I was really surprised to see it's also there with Mélenchon. There's Le Pen, or well, this house price relationship is picking up something about Le Pen's type of politics, which I think is very second dimension. 
And I'm going to conclude with countries I started with, where I told you that had much more diverse wealth experiences than you might anticipate, the Nordic countries. And they also have strong, increasingly strong populist parties. So in work with um, Jacob Nyrup, my, my DPhil student, and two Danish scholars, we're using Danish registry data uh, where we can get municipal house prices and municipal support for the Danish People's Party in elections dating back to the late 1990s. And what we can do here is look at election to election changes in house prices at the municipal level and election to election changes in support for the DPP. So that's quite a sort of robust st statistical way of doing things. We're netting out sort of any level effects in municipalities and just looking at these changes. And now we're extending it to three other Scandinavian countries. So here's what it looks like if you don't just look at changes but at levels. Right, we have the, the krona price per square meter, and we have support for the DPP. You can see it's basically flat for years, and then at some time around the financial crisis, it starts becoming negatively related, so that the level effect is, is strong and statistically significant here. It turns out that if you look at changes, that's always been going on, but in a much more moderate way. So this is the, the ele various elections between 1908 and 1901, 1904, 1905. These are European, these are Danish. And the effects of changes in house prices on support for the DPP. So there is this effect that as places where house prices were rising a little bit more became less supportive of the DPP. But it really happens here. Why? Financial crisis. And the question is, is all this stuff post-financial crisis? Well, it might be. Here's Sweden. Right? This is the this vote for the share for the Sweden Democrats. All right, we know that's gone up a lot recently. But it's also become much more strongly negatively correlated with house prices in Sweden. Okay. Old industrial declining areas, at least declining in terms of house prices. That's where the street and Democrats find their support. Also true for the true Finns here. And even in Norway, yeah, the, the effect is only negative with this kind of lowest fit here as opposed to the straight line. But it used to be that there was a positive relationship with support for the Progress Party, which is much less populous than the others. And that has flattened out. So if we look at changes, the effect in Norway is actually similar to both. So to conclude, what's going on? Well, the redistribution stuff is interesting, and I've been working on that for years, but this stuff is, is mad, that in seven different countries we're seeing the same type of relationship. Is it housing or just local economies? That's sort of hard to pull out. But of course, what is housing but an extremely good proxy for local levels of wealth? And that seems to be a, a very strong predictor for popular support. It may be or have been accentuated by the Great Recession, although they're in smaller levels all along. And I will stop right there. Thank you very much, Ben. That was fascinating. Um, we do have some time, a uh, little bit of time, for some uh, questions. But before we take any, I should just warn you that this is being filmed and webcast. So only ask a question if you're happy to be filmed. Um, we have a roving mic. So if I could have any hands, um, and then can we go back there, Clara? Uh, th thanks very much for that talk. Just. Um, on your relationships, for example, related to uh, Brexit between house prices and those who voted Remain, uh, you pointed out that there were statistical associations in all of your graphs, but perhaps what was more striking is the amount of variation that was not explained. In other words, yeah. you had statistical st significance, but the the R squareds, if you like, were probably rather low they're on about, those graphs. If, if, if so, you want to know, they're about 0.5. So it explains about half of the variation, which in this business is, ain't bad. No, that's sure. But it also suggests that there are other factors mm. to be explained Absolutely. in that data. So do, do you have any comments on what are the other factors that are important in explaining that variation? Yeah, very quickly. So Matt Goodwin has done some interesting, and I, I broadly plausible work about changes in the immigrant population locally. And I certainly find that that uh, is, so is negatively um, associated with remain or positively associated with leave. And levels of the immigrant community is precisely the opposite. And that's, I think, a paradox, if it's a paradox, it probably isn't, um, that lots of people are aware of, that places with high levels of immigration tended to vote remain, but places where immigration was rising relatively high tended to go leave. So, so that matters a lot. Local <laughs> demographics matter a lot. Working age population, that's the other really strong relationship. Um, places with populations that are older and with more children, both voted leave. Um, the older part is probably easy to explain when you look at you know, survey data. Older people did tend to vote for leave more, so there's a compositional effect there. 
the younger, you know, the under 15s thing is, is interesting. It may just reflect sort of people in suburbs, hard to tell. Uh, thank you very much for a very informative talk. I'd just like to ask, why do people with certain, if you could shed some light on why some people with certain levels of income vote the way they vote? I mean, generally speaking, the, the story for income is that most tax and spending applies to your income first. Um, so broadly, if you look at a big cross-national social surveys, income will be one of the best positive predictors, sorry, the best negative predictors of supporting uh, redistribution. And that is, I mean, after all, if the question says, would you like to redistribute resources between rich and poor and you're rich, you are the target. Now, with that said, there are lots and lots of analyses that have, uh, of especially American politics, that have shown that that income gradient, as we call it, is really high in some places and really low in others. So in Connecticut, if anything, it's the other way. Um, and um, I remember a Republican friend of mine in the States being amazed when I told him, yeah, Repu Re Republicans get more support from richer people. He was like, that can't be true. But it really is in the aggregate. But it does vary from location to location. In general, it's been pretty strong in the UK, but the income gradient was less strong than you might think in 2017. And that was because the richer areas, many of them did vote for Corbyn, so that sort of netted out the within region effect. Hello. Oh, thanks so much for the fascinating talk. I'm just really interested whether you have more thoughts on the very last question you had on the slide, which was um, why are economic factors bleeding into cultural preferences? I asked this as an economist because would I, you know, when I try to regulate wealth by your favorite means inheritance tax, for example, would you hope to also influence the cultural factors? So I think political, I, I, look, I think people live in specific places. Um, which neither economists or political scientists are frankly that great at talking about. Um, the reason I think housing is germane is because it's hard to sell a house and to move, and so it locks you into your community. Not only that, I think the difference in areas, house prices, matters because it makes it impossible to move from poor areas to rich areas, which then locks people out of um, those areas. That creates discontent, but it also means that fewer people they know move to those areas and buy property. So... One way of thinking about how housing connects the economic and the cultural is to think about cultures as forming when groups of people spend a lot of time together. And the housing market does lock people into places. And so you know, I think that's one of the reasons why these two things connect together. But you know, this, this does not resolve the puzzle of how to explain populism, but it provides a way of bridging some of these cultural and economic stories. Thank you for your time. Um, uh, I have two questions. First of all, you know, did you look into the factors, you know, relating to the causation between house prices and populist parties versus, you know, the third factor, which, you know, you could assume is income or yeah. something else? And then the second one is over the last, say, 70 years, home ownership trends have changed drastically throughout yeah. Europe in terms yeah, of true. home ownership has gone up a lot. And, you know, do you have any insight into how that has affected politics over time and what that means for the future? Yeah, so briefly to the first, it's, it's very hard to causally identify this stuff as well as you might want to do. Um, it's certainly in our, to give you an example, in, in Scandinavian data, we look at, we control for um, changes in um, municipal incomes, really through wages and actually through education composition. We, so we're doing our best at that, but these things are not independent of one another, right? So when I get richer, I can buy a nicer house and I can save money into that. And so I remember when I worked on my first paper on this, the, the editor, I think, was always like, well, why don't you look for where an earthquake happened in Los Angeles and like, use that? And I was like, yeah, I guess that would be another way of doing this, right? Um, of course, then you've got the earthquake factor to take into account. It's not, it's not a very, it is a natural experiment, but it's not a typical natural experiment. Um, home ownership. Okay, so home ownership rates tend to accentuate the responsiveness of politicians to the housing market. So in some of my work looking at whether right-wing parties are more likely to act on this changing electorate by cutting spending more and house prices are rising, that is accentuated in countries with high home ownership where there is a plausible electoral audience for that and not in Germany. And so I have a German postdoc, and he has to spend all of his time doing this kind of brain shift of like, well, the thing is, in Germany, you know, this is less salient for people. It really is less salient in, in a country like that where fewer than 50%, at least 
many years of people have uh, owned their house. I hope, I hope Jonas isn't here and I haven't trampled him. Okay. More questions? Uh, over the years, there have been several suggestions to address the wealth inequality of wealth problem under one name or another, one formation or another, of land tax. Yeah. Anything on the go on that recently? And, uh, any thoughts? Um, I, I um, host an event at the Nuffield Foundation in London, which was with, with policymakers, and of course people really wanted to talk about the land tax. And then um, I invited a pollster. Uh, he'd, he'd been Labour's pollster in 2015, James Morris, works for, um, who did work for GFK. Um, and he went straight up and he put a whole bunch of YouGov polls about rank, rank your taxes in, in your order of preference. And the least popular taxes are anything related to housing. Absolutely anathema. Inheritance tax, council tax, the idea of a property or land tax. And so I think people have to take seriously, getting back to my earlier point about housing and culture, housing also has great sentimental value for people. The families have great sentimental value for people. And so, I mean, people have, since Henry George at least, people have made a, you know, very, very clear, clean arguments for land taxes that never get adopted. Uh, there was a Danish political party that were founded on Henry George's policies in the early 1900s. Sorry, early, um, yeah, early 1900s. But, it, but I think there's, you know, this is not a new story. We've had 150 years of debating a land tax and very little political ability to get away. So that means something. And I'm assuming James's polls suggest that it's probably because when you, when you mention this to people, they think of it as a garden tax. They think of it as a tax on their family. And then it becomes anathema. Time for one more question. You had one um, interesting graph about value of the houses, but you, you didn't. It seems like most of these asset calculations um, don't have liabilities against them. Would mortgages change, do you yeah. think? The... Yeah, it's really interesting. So with mortgages, you have to think, are you more or, or less, do you benefit more or less from an increase in, in house prices and a decrease in house prices in the way I'm conjecturing? Right? So on the one hand, you got a mortgage and your house goes up, you just use leverage in a way that's extremely beneficial to you. So that should make you more excited about spending. And if your house price goes down, you stand more risk of negative equity. So on that basis, one might anticipate that house prices would accentuate this uh, redistributive effect, and maybe even the populist effect, for all I know, for mortgage holders. But on the other hand, they own less of the property as well, right? So it feels somehow like the effect shouldn't be strongest for mortgage holders because they have less principal. I sort of side with the former, that mortgage holders are more responsive, and that's what the data shows, but not super cleanly. The final thing I will say on this is, in Eastern European data, the LITS survey that looked at a whole bunch of Eastern European countries asked people, did you borrow in a foreign currency? Those people, when house prices go down, become very, very supportive of redistribution. Right? So when you're really exposed, and you have a house price collapse, and yeah, the mortgage holders will be the first out with the pitchforks. Okay, thank you. Um, just before we close, um, I want to draw your attention to the next uh, lecture in this series. It's actually on Tuesday um, rather than Thursday, at five o'clock in this room. Um, it's Lord Nicholas Stern, who will probably need no introduction to anyone here. Um, he's given a couple of wonderful uh, lectures here in Oxford um, in the last uh, couple of years on climate change. He will be talking on something rather different on Tuesday. And, uh, the lecture is called How Lives Change, Palampur, India, and Development Economics. And he's basically um, a lecture focused on one village in India using a unique data set which covers seven full surveys of, a, of this village, one every decade, going right back to ind independence. Um, so he'll reflect on the past, present, and future of India, of development economics, seen through the experience of that village. So you're warmly welcome um, to come to that. It will be followed by a reception to which all attendees will be invited. Um, so there's also a reward in it for you. Um, but I'd just like now to close by thanking Ben for shedding new light on two subjects that I thought had been done to death, property prices and Brexit. So um, it was a really excellent talk, and thank you very much indeed. <laughs>